Hello and welcome to the Mascan Education Village, uh, sponsored by Mascan Normal. Please visit their website at www.masscann.org. And while you're there, sign up and join Mascan. We represent cannabis consumers in Massachusetts, and we hope you'll join us and help out. So this is the Mascan Education Village. One of our uh, uh, education aims in Mascan is to talk about history. And this is all about the history of Mascan Normal. Uh, we've been speaking with some of the people that were uh, involved in activism here in Massachusetts very, very early on. Uh, and that included, of course, uh, Dick Evans uh, and Linda Noel so far. Uh, and now I'm very happy to be interviewing Maddie Webster. She is our founder, uh, founding treasurer. She's a co-founder of MassCan, a uh, longtime cannabis activist, also a co-founder uh, and apparently still director of the Drug Policy uh, Foundation in Massachusetts. Uh, and also she has been, we've just been discussing her adventures at sea, uh, which apparently haven't been as uh, adventurous as of recent, but hopefully she'll be able to get back to that. Uh, I'm Bill Downing. I'm a former long-standing officer and director of MassCan Normal. Uh, Maddie Webster is a person who was instrumental in the formation and development of MassCan Normal, and by extension, the populist movement for cannabis law in Massachusetts. If marijuana law reform has benefited you in any way, Maddie is one of the very few activists who I can testify by my own witness, toiled for years voluntarily and has earned your appreciation. Maddie excelled at meeting with legislators, organizing events, and petitioning in particular. Maddie, thank you for all your hard work educating the public and enabling sweeping moderation of cannabis laws in Massachusetts. And also thank you for agreeing to speak with us today. All right. So Maddie, um, before MassCan was formed, I know uh, you uh, had, were right there at the start. So uh, I'm sure you uh, were experienced with what was going on before then. Uh, I know it's a long time ago. <laughs> right, I studied for this. <laughs> it's like 30 years ago. I had to recall a lot of things and the order in which they happened. Oh, okay. So yeah. hopefully you've been successful at recalling all that stuff. Yes, I have. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, so how did it all start? You. Okay, well, um, there were two, two things I want to talk about, like MassCan was formed in the fall of 1990, but I kind of got involved in activism a year before that, um, and, and I can go through the, the four things that happened, um, and that started, uh, and I'll, I'll say it more in depth, but that started my partner, Dave Getchell, and his son, uh, who I spent every weekend at their house, but the two of them were arrested in Operation Great Merchant in 1989, which was a federal sting operation uh, going after indoor growers. And I think um, I think we'll talk about that again in a in a minute. But so I I that really opened my eyes to uh, what I should have seen long before. So that was the fall of 1989. And then sometime in the spring of 1990, there was a big meeting. I don't know, it seemed to be in a classroom somewhere. And I was kind of shocked because I went there and there were like 30 or 40 people. And, uh, and I think by then the drug war had, you know, it had kind of been building for decades and, you know, somehow it had reached a peak and people were ready to do something. So there was this meeting in the springtime and um, I don't know what kind of action items came out of it, but I know what I did. And that was um, a few months later in June of 1990, Nelson Mandela came to Boston to speak on the Esplanade. And there were a quarter of a million people there. I think it was like June 23rd, 1990. And um, a very peaceful event and very well attended. And there were only two arrests for during the entire day that Mandela was there and speaking. 
One was a, a puppeteer named Ian McKinnon, who we, we worked with for many years. And I don't know, he was doing some kind of risque puppeteering about Ronald Reagan, probably. So he was arrested. And then um, I suspect at the spring meeting, um, I had met Linda Noel and uh, John Harden, Ron Noel, so John and Don Harden, Linda and Ron. And I think they were all freedom fighters. I didn't kind of know what that meant at the time, but they seemed to wear three cornered hats and colonial outfits and, and, and they were like all revved up. They knew about Jack Herrera and the emperor wears new clothes and they wanted to, you know, uh, hemp to save the world. And um, again, this was all new stuff to me. So I agreed to go work at this table on the Boston uh, Esplanade. And, um, and we had like a huge bag of hemp seeds from the Agway store and Linda and Ron had broken them into little baggies for that said hemp, they'll make your birds sing. And we had lots of literature and, uh, you know, it was all just hemp seed from the Agway. Well, the undercover narcotics squad showed up at, you know, four in the afternoon, just convinced that they were busting this like big drug operation or something. And uh, this was a new experience for me anyway. Um, so they confiscated the, the hemp seeds and uh, just kind of really scared us all. I think they went through our knapsacks and stuff and then they arrested Ron Noel. And um, I think Steve Epstein had to come into town and bail him out. And uh, it continu continued on when the thing came to court a few months later, the lawyer carried in the bag of hemp seeds to court and he got arrested on the steps of the courthouse. So it just is an example of how kind of crazy things kind of had gotten. But that was my first action as a pre mass can member. And um, and then that fall, like, so that was in June. And then that October, we formed Mass Can. Um, I actually don't recall where we were and uh, how this happened, but I know I was one of the founding members. Well, um, I can tell you, uh, I think that classroom meeting uh, is where Steve Epstein claims he first met me. Um, and, uh, but I, I have no recollection of that meeting at all myself. Right. Uh, my first recollection of a meeting was uh, at your house in Cambridge um, <clears throat> or Somerville, David Somerville. Square, I should say, yeah, Somerville. And um, uh, it was just you and I and Dave and uh, Steve Epstein and maybe one or two other people were there. Um, and at that point, Dave, I believe, was the president. Right. Um, so do you recall that whole thing about Dave I, becoming president? And I remember that Dave, Dave was like a very solitary person. He didn't want to know very many people or he just wanted to kind of uh, live his own life, but I think he was so shocked at what had happened to him with being arrested that he uh, he was willing to step up to being president. And I think I remember that meeting at our house because I think Dave always said, like, you, you showed up and you were like, I want to be the librarian or you, you know, like, and Dave was like, oh my God, this person, you know, th is fabulous. Like uh, he knew right away that um, what you were all about and that you would be, you know, fantastic. So that's my recollection from that meeting. Uh, yeah. And then I also remember not too long thereafter, we actually did a, a, a news interview in your kitchen as well. Uh, and and again, I think it was you and me and Dave, uh, and I'm not sure if anybody else was there, but that was another early, early remembrance of mine. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's your recollection is similar to mine at that. 
Um, I, I, um, I, I want to backtrack just a little bit um, about what the um, activism, like marijuana activism was in Massachusetts, like long before mass cameras formed. And I think we benefited mass can by the fact that there, for a long time, uh, with the ACLU uh, in particular, um, and, and other activists, people, sometimes through the Unitarian Church, um, had been working in Massachusetts for really decades before Mass Can was formed. And I always heard, I don't know if it's true, that the state normal chapter was run out of the ACLU office in the early 70s. And I mean, that's when Lester Grinspoon published his book. I, I would suspect that Dick Evans would go back to that early date, but I don't know. Uh, well, he didn't really mention um, that, but uh, he's always been a Western kind of character. And, uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure he worked with the ACLU and stuff like that. But right. uh, not being in Boston might not have been aware of all the details of what was going right. on. Uh, well, I'm not sure when it was, but at some point the ACLU created their drug policy task force. Right. Um, it'd be interesting to know what year it was that uh, that, that happened. But yeah. As I recall, John Holmes was the chair. Right. So, of course, tax. Uh, so, uh, I, let's see, mass I, can had to be formed. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I just want to say one other thing. I didn't realize, and partly just even uh, preparing for this interview, I really did. I didn't really know how all these uh, freedom fighters with the tri-cornered hats, how they all knew each other. And I guess they were a group of people that formed through high times in uh, like four year, maybe 1986 or something. So they were already activists and we had a handful of people in Massachusetts who were already fired up and um, yeah, I think that's true. And uh, I, one of the people I'm going to be interviewing is uh, uh, is uh, John Leonard. And uh, of course, he was involved with activism here in Massachusetts right. long before Mass Camp came about. So we'll get another perspective from him on that as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, then Mass Camp needed to be uh, created, founded. Um, and so I suppose you and the 12 other signers um, uh, somehow either shared paperwork or met together and signed some documents that were submitted to the state for the formation of mass can do you recall that whole mechanic that the mechanics of that no i have no recollection at all <laughs> sorry okay well i know your signature is on it so okay good <laughs> whether you whether you want to remember it or not you did right. sign that document <laughs> Uh, especially since you were the the treasurer, your your name was actually listed on it twice. All right. And officer, sir, and yeah. once was in a, a Did sign. we have any money? Probably very little. Um, yeah, um, very little. Uh, Linda Noel was saying that we had a single donor who was an anonymous uh, Boston police officer, hmm. um, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we started getting memberships and things like that. Right. So had some trickle of money coming in. Yeah. Um, so uh, now, since you, you did mention Operation Green Merchant uh, and, uh, and how that uh, hit you and your partner and his son, uh, what, what were they doing? How did that happen? What, what was the whole deal? What happened? Um, well, it was a, a federal DEA sting operation in October of 1989, and uh, the DEA arrested, I think, 119 people in 46 states, like in a 24-hour period. And um, they were going after indoor growers in particular, and um, the way, and my partner Dave had just harvested 
oh, six or eight plants, perhaps growing in the basement of, of his tiny rental cottage and down in Pembroke. And then his son, Carl, had bought, you know, one of those little plexiglass tabletop phototrons at one point and had managed to kind of make a go of uh, that by, you know, diligently working away. And um, the way in which Operation Green Merchant worked was they, the DEA was basically using the advertisements in High Times Magazine for grow stores where you might buy soil and pots and whether you're growing orchids or or marijuana. So they, they use the grow stores in High Times Magazine, um, any lighting companies that advertised in High Times, and then, um, and then the, I, I assume those were just places that advertised on their own. But then the DEA put uh, an ad in where you could send away for like $30 and get 10 seeds from Amsterdam. And, um, and it was all, you know, they would be mailed to you in carbon paper and it was perfectly legal. Nobody would find out about it. So I think I chipped in $10 and, you know, we mailed, Dave mailed it in, he did it himself and got 30 seeds. And then uh, he did buy a grow light, which was delivered by uh, United Parcel Service who volunteered to turn over all their records to the DEA of anybody who bought a light. And then, um, I don't know, maybe he bought soil or something for, I, I, I don't know about that. Um, and then they, Dave's son, Carl, was working that summer for a house painter. And this guy was kind of a ne'er-do-well with a bunch of, you know, breaking and entering, this and that, um, you know, various kind of petty crimes, I think. Um, and so this guy had turned to be a confidential informant, um, I think just really a few weeks before they were arrested. But anyway, he had, I don't know if he managed to buy an eighth of an ounce of, from Carl or whether he claimed he saw Carl selling something to somebody, uh, but the DA put this together and Dave was one of the 119 people who were arrested and they, they served the warrant like in the middle of the day on a Monday and Dave worked the midnight to eight shift. So these, the SWAT team came in terrified. They thought they were coming into an armed drug den and, um, and in the middle of the day, they burst into Dave's bedroom when he was asleep and, you know, yelled, don't move, don't move, don't move. And um, anyway, luckily Dave didn't get killed in that but he and Carl and actually another friend of Carl's got arrested and um, they, you know, had to spend the next six or eight months. Uh, they all hired attorneys, but then having basically to do a lot of their own legal work. And um, they ended up, um, I think it ended up being a misdemeanor um, and Dave was on parole for a year or two. So luckily he avoided any, any jail time. Um, and and, and uh, all of this is an awful experience, but there's an added, uh, added uh, uh, ironic twist to this whole thing. Right. And that is one of the reasons why Dave was trying to grow marijuana. Right. Um, uh, no, it wasn't. Um, it's it's a it's a worse twist than that because he wasn't trying to grow marijuana for medical reasons. He had always grown his own, usually way out in the woods, and he never sold it. He gave it to friends, or um, uh, he just shared it, you know, um, with friends. But when this arrest occurred, he had noticed a mole on his arm that looked suspicious, but he was so kind of freaked out by the, what was happening with lawyers and, and having to kind of fight for, um, uh, to stay out of jail, that he put off having the mole on his arm looked at for six or eight months until the whole thing had, uh, um, you know, worked its way through. 
And then when he went to the dermatologist, it was melanoma. And melanoma is something you really don't want to wait six or eight months for. So he was di- so really he was diagnosed with cancer right after that. Um, uh, you know, the mist- misdemeanor was determined. And then he died uh, six years later. He died in 1996 of melanoma. I see. How awful. So he was just growing as he always had recreational marijuana or adult use. I see. Right. Uh, wow. But uh, what a double whammy uh, to have the uh, targeted an Operation Green Merchant. Yeah. Uh, and then um, have, have, having a very, very serious skin cancer. Right. Um, and did Dave try to use cannabis as part of his cancer regimen at all? Or? He did. He did. Um, a few years, uh, you know, initially with a skin cancer, you're not really sick. You um, and so a few years into it, when he was uh, undergoing uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, he had just terrible, terrible nausea. Like he just couldn't even move or he would uh, get sick. And um, he tried marijuana and actually it didn't work for him. So, but you know, the idea was you should be able to try any medicine and works for some people, it doesn't work for others. So for him, it was not that effective. Got it. Right. Uh, And, uh, you know, of course, there's now more evidence about uh, people using cannabis as a way of dealing with cancer, not just with the symptoms itself. Right. Yeah. uh, But that's something that's come more recently. Yeah. so, uh, do you recall, did, did you, I haven't heard anything about uh, the uh, first Freedom Rally in North Adams. Were, did you know about that? Is that something you... I don't, to? that I, that was in eight, 1989, right? I believe so. And so since I, you know, it was really Operation Green Merchant, um, probably right. a month or two later that um, I, no, I was not aware of that. So I... I don't know anything about that. I got you. Okay. But I was there like the following um, fall. I think we had a, uh, a rally at the USS Constitution. We did. I, I think I remember maybe Don Fiedler. Was he the head of Normal? Normal was going through changes. He, I'm not sure if he was the uh, executive director at that point in time, but yeah, it sounds feasible. He was the executive director at some right. point. So he t- signed my t-shirt. It's probably in the other room. So Ah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we had, you know, uh, I'm sure small rally at the USS Constitution. And then, um, and then we had one, I think the following year on the steps of the state house. Yes, that's true. Um, and then I, and I remember that one. And then I remember kind of moving to the great discussions about going to the common and the Parkman bandstand where we could have performers or speakers. Um, and then it's all uphill from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> As you can attest. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the, all that is, uh, holds true to my recollections as well. Yeah. Uh, So one of the things that happened early on that I was able to talk to Linda about, uh, Dick Evans didn't really know about this stuff, but you probably do as well. Uh, I have uh, some pretty uh, great memories and interesting memories about uh, Massachusetts Coalition for Medicinal Cannabis and our attempts in Cambridge and, uh, and then in the state. Uh, with Governor Weld, who eventually signed uh, the first medical marijuana bill uh, in 1991 that created a a therapeutic research program at the Department of Public Health. Um, Do you remember the MC Square, Massachusetts Coalition? Um, How could I forget MC Squared? Um, Because, I mean, 
we we or perhaps John Holmes was Holmes was always I mean John Holmes is an unbelievable person who was kind of there from the early 1990s and he just knew the whole political landscape he knew how to strategize political uh, legislative campaigns or ways to build grassroots support and coalitions. And he, he knew all these organizations, maybe through the ACLU or uh, I don't know how he knew all these organizations. So he had kind of a plan for where we could go in the 1990s and um, uh, filing bills and, you know, which political people we could uh, work with and whatever. So, um, and he would coin these names for like, so mass MC squared was what the mass coalition for medicinal cannabis. It was, yeah. And um, he would produce literature, you know, like a little pamphlet to hand out. Um, and the big project that we did that um, in 1991 was, um, kind of mass cans first year was we gathered 14,000 signatures in the city of Cambridge by going door to door, um, knocking on people's doors. And it was basically um, getting people to sign a statement that said they thought that uh, the medical use of marijuana was a something was an important thing, or I don't know how it was worded, worded. but I know that I spent like every weekend day for like a month or six weeks or something, literally eight hours a day, um, gathering these signatures and many other people did. Like John had us meet, I think we met at Jane Litwin's house, um, right on the edge of Cambridge and we would just fan out and gather these signatures. Yep, John had uh, maps of the whole uh, rural uh, Cambridge area and uh, assign, you know, blocks of addresses to people. Right. And uh, I remember um, I did it a few times. I did it just on my own, walking from door to door and knocking yeah. on doors. And I did okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But then, then I brought Heather, my wife, along with me, and I did so much better. Right. <laughs> I think having the, a woman with you somehow takes some of the threatening uh, problem away. Yeah. Uh, and my responses were much better. Yeah. Uh, including, uh, you know, running into people who were, for instance, doctors who were just amazingly enthusiastic saying, oh, boy, I'm so happy this is finally possibly happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was very uplifting how many, you know, positive um, experiences. And, and I remember people were pretty willing to sign. Um, I do remember when we were all working different streets and in, in neighborhoods near Davis Square, and I all of a sudden heard this like shrieking and yelling. And it was Jay Litwin, I guess, that knocked on somebody's door who really hated marijuana. And you could actually hear two blocks away, this person. Oh, wow. So, um, but yeah, that was a major, um, I mean, for many years, I, I would get to the end of a year and I'd be like, oh my God, I've spent so much time on mass can and like gathering signatures. I can't do this again next year, but it's addictive. So, <laughs> anyway, so um, I've forgotten the question, but anyway, MC squared was the campaign. And the, the goal, there were kind of two goals of this campaign. One was Cambridge was the district of um, the Speaker of the House, Charlie Flaherty. So we were gathering these signatures to demonstrate to him that his supporters were behind this issue. Um, and, um, and then, uh, I guess that was pretty much it, but it was kind of like also to demonstrate to legislators that this would be the theme throughout the 90s, that mar marijuana and in particular medical marijuana was a winning issue from them. Like they would become more popular with their constituents if they supported medical marijuana. 
Right. Uh, and of course, we were very lucky that uh, we had uh, uh, Governor Well, who was a sim sympathetic governor for uh, this issue throughout the 90s as well. Yes. Uh, and as I recall, he had a relative who had asthma and who had used cannabis to treat asthma attacks. Huh. I, I didn't remember that detail, but I always knew, that, I mean, he, he supported medical marijuana on his, on his own. That was something he believed in. And, uh, right. and um, so, so actually, if we go over the two pieces of legislation, because, or maybe that was going to be your next question. I don't know, but. Well, we can talk about them. Um, uh, I just, uh, you know, I can recap them real quick. Uh, uh, one, the 1991 law uh, created a uh, therapeutic, uh, cannabis therapeutic research program at the Department of Public Health. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the beauty of the program was that they were supposed to take in patients into the program and then distribute cannabis to them so that it could be studied to find out whether these patients had positive responses uh, or and if I find out if there were any negative responses. Um, and then at the last minute, um, and I believe John Holmes was involved in these negotiations, um, one of the leaders, uh, I believe it was perhaps the, the uh, Senate president um, interjected language saying that the cannabis for the research program had to come through the federal government. Uh -huh. Is that your re recollection? Yeah. 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 And so then that made it kind of useless. Right. Uh, it was, yeah, it was a poison pill. Yeah. Basically for the legislation. Uh, so we suffered through the 90s with the Department of Public Health uh, doing absolutely nothing uh, because they had, they'd, they'd made a stabbing effort at, at fulfilling their mission and then just gave up completely. Uh, but then uh, later on, we had the second piece of legislation that was signed in 1997, I believe. Right. Uh, and that ordered them to open the program by accepting, uh, by putting out a, an application and accepting applications from patients. And even if no patients received any cannabis, the idea of it was that if they were participating in the program, they could use that as an affirmative defense if they had been charged uh -huh. with possession. Right, that, I think that second one was called the Joe Hutchins bill because it was named after him because he had been arrested for using marijuana and he had something called scleroderma and uh, the judge said I I can't you know I have to convict you or whatever because there's no medical necessity defense in Massachusetts so the strategy was this would create a medical necessity defense right I'm not sure that anyone ever was able to use it in court to defend themselves right uh, I don't recall that ever happening like, but they, I think they were really important, really important victories for medical marijuana because basically to get a bill through the legislature is, you know, nearly impossible and signed by a governor. And, um, you know, the public didn't know, you know, the fine points of whether something uh, became, you know, functional or not. Right. I. I want to say another thing that was important about our role in in creating these bills. I mean, again, John Holmes had the strategy. I don't know who wrote the bills. Maybe uh, Steve Epstein, Dick Evans, or a, a whole bunch of uh, lawyers. Um, but um, Pat Jalen was a newly elected representative in Somerville. She had just been elected, I think, in 1991. So she was a freshman rep in Massachusetts and she had a whole agenda of, she'd been politically active all her life, but not on marijuana. And um, she, you know, as a, as a freshman, she didn't really want to take on that issue because she was afraid of what uh, marijuana, you know, would do to her reputation. But anyway, Dave and I lived in Somerville 
and you can have a legislator sponsor a bill on behalf of a constituent. So she sponsored that first bill in 1991 on Dave's behalf. And um, I, um, and once, it, you know, even though it's something she didn't really want to do, she really went to bat for the bill. I mean, if she had to go talk to a Kiwanis club, she would go talk, she would, um, you know, she spent uh, a fair amount of effort on it. Um, but the end result was, I think it passed, I don't, do you remember, I think it passed like two to one or something like that. Or it no, was, it didn't it was, pass, it wasn't a ballot question. Yeah, well, it was voted on by the legislature. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, with so many of these things, we, you and I know, we've learned many, many times that it's the uh, Senate president and uh, the Speaker of the House. Right. And they run all the committees and uh, they basically rule the floor votes. Right. Uh, so as long as you have those two guys in agreement, in agreement and, and that's the way this whole thing was done, as far as right. I recall from John Holmes, was it was Weld, uh, Flaherty, and whoever the uh, Senate president was. Right. Probably Billy Bulger. Probably Billy Bulger, yeah. And, um, and, and they basically just sat down and worked it out. And then right. it was just a matter of, you know, an up and down vote. Yeah. Well, I remember Pat Jalen calling me out of the blue at one point and she said, I don't believe it. It just came out of like the committee on third reading. And again, legislators and, and we as activists are used to bills getting tabled, you know, immediately. And, um, and, and she was just shocked. And so, um, yeah, and then it went through all its committees and Weld signed it and, um, and she had a victory and she found it to be a very um, popular, uh, you know, with her constituents for, do, for doing that. Well, that, be, uh, that should be a lesson to anyone who's working on uh, legislation is that uh, if, uh, if the right people want to see it move, it just moves. Right. And yeah. it goes quick. Yeah. Although I'm sure we spent a lot of effort, get, you know, getting people up um, for the legislative hearings. Like I remember two people, Debbie Talshier, who had advanced multiple sclerosis and her friend Lois Harris, who was a cancer survivor. And they would come like to all the hearings or they'd be interviewed on the news. And Debbie was in um, a wheelchair at that point. She was not very mobile. So yeah, I'm sure we put a lot of effort into the um, legislation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and just so people understand how difficult it is to go to these hearings, especially if you're in a wheelchair. Oh my gosh, I just can't imagine how difficult that must be. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, most people have jobs and they can't necessarily take an entire day off. Yeah. And that's what's required in order to go to these hearings because they have 20, 30 bills they're going to hear within a certain number of hours during the day. You don't know when they're going to talk about which bill. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if you're coming in in a car, you've got to park in Boston. You've got to walk up the hill to get up to the Capitol building. You, yeah. You're crammed into these hearing rooms with other people. Uh, of course, now with this virus around, I have no idea how they're going to. Right. Yeah. Unless they do it uh, the way we're having our meeting right now. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I have one more. Um, little story, and it might have been the 1996 bill, but uh, John Holmes had made this connection, but I'm sure it was through Bill Weld, and that is that um, Polly Logan, who was the chair of the Republican State Committee, and this very kind of dignified older woman from the South Shore, um, she, uh, she also was a supporter of um, medical marijuana, but, you know, as the chair of the Republican State Committee, she and Weld were, you know, worked hand in hand. So if, if the bill got stuck in a committee, uh, which I remember one time it did, there was like, they didn't have a majority. So somebody from the committee called me and then John Holmes said, call Polly Logan because it was a Republican that was holding it up. I called Polly Logan. She said, oh, well, Governor Weld's point man in the, in the Senate or House is 
uh, Norton or something like that. So I called Norton's office and said, Holly Logan said, blah, blah, blah. And then it came out of committee. So it was like, we got to see how things, you know, move through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's interesting that you, there was, uh, you know, bipartisan support. Yeah. Uh, and that's great. That's great to hear. We did have some early Republican. Uh, I remember Bob Headland came up from the South Shore and yep. spoke at our rally for us. Yeah. Uh, but he he's been uh, kind of uh, waffly about our issue. He's been right. on both sides. So, yeah. uh, but it is interesting to have Republicans that are willing to stand up. It is a liber. It's it's a very libertarian value. Saying right. that this is uh, not the government's business. It's private. Yeah. Uh, so, in the early days of the Freedom Rally, we met uh, many leaders for our cause, uh, and not just at the Freedom Rally, but also at, at, at membership meetings and, and, and other venues. Uh, of course, uh, Jack Herrer came up to speak a few times. Keith Strout spoke here in Esther many, many times. We had John Sinclair and Lester Grinspoon and Elvie Musica. Can you recall uh, meeting some of those people and maybe you've got uh, some interesting insights? Well, I wish I had some real juicy stories, but I met um, many, you know, I met L.B. Musica, uh, John Sinclair, you know, all, all the people who spoke at the rallies. Maybe I just didn't go to the parties afterwards. I don't know what it was, but um, the one, so the one party, uh, um, the one person I really got to know um, was Lester Grinspoon. And um, I do remember going to a party gathering at his house, and I think it was in the 1990s, so maybe it was after this um, second bill passed. And there was a mixture of mass can people. It was a pool party where he lived, and um, and there were people like Tony, Tony Windsor from the ACLU and, um, and Dick Evans and, a, you know, a, a lot of fun and I was kind of like so pleased to be included in this you know party scene and the the only thing I remember Tony Windsor um, who was quite a character and I worked with his uh, wife Roz on other criminal justice issues but anyway he had this classic rum punch that he made called like Auntie M's rum punch and it was just like white lightning and he cooked this thing up for every every event that he went to and um, anyway I remember ah. that. That's that's and my big story. It delivered a knockout punch. Yep. <laughs> so, um, again, Jack Herrera was not someone I even knew about before. But one of the uh, early things we did as Mass Can was we rented the Old South Church in Boston. Do you remember that? We did yeah. And we had Jack Herrera come as a speaker and. Um, I, one of the things about the 1990s, like about activism before the internet was you had to be out in the streets handing out leaflets to get people to come. Like maybe you could get an ad on WBCN or uh, wherever Chuck U was or whatever, maybe some radio things or maybe the Phoenix would, would list an ad. But any event that you put on, you had to... Um, to be leafleting like crazy at universities anywhere you thought. So um, I leafleted like crazy and heard Jack Herrera for the first time. And we had a good crowd there too. Yeah, we did. It was a great event. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the North Church was a wonderful place. Uh, right. Um, uh, you know, some people may not know, but um, he wrote about how Boston was such a, a center for the production of hemp. Huh. Rope and hemp cloth, uh, and uh, I did dig out my book. The emperor wears. Wow, there it is. The emperor wears no clothes. There's Jack's book. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and on page three or four, there's an illustration of uh, the USS Constitution, and uh, I think it says twenty tons of hemp, something like that. Uh -huh. uh, and so that's all the sailcloth, all the all the rope, all the uniforms, all the mats, all the paper. Uh, all the caulking uh, between the, the boards to keep the water out uh, was all hemp. Right. Uh, so anyway, uh, yep, uh, I remember uh, meeting Lester. Uh, we also had a, a test, uh, 
a, a, an honorary dinner for Lester at uh, Legal Seafoods. I don't know. Do you re do you remember that uh, that night? I remember Al Giordano was there. Uh, a lot of uh, people that were inter involved early I, on. I suspect I was there, but I I can't remember the details. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you and John Leonard and Scott Mortimer uh, founded and ran the Drug Policy Foundation in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, sometimes referred to as the Drug Policy Forum. Right. Sure. That would be, um, yeah, it was the Drug Policy Forum. The Drug Policy Foundation was way back, like around 1990 with, uh, who was it, Arnold Treeback and Kevin Zeese. It was like one of the earliest. Um, or so we formed well um it's a longer story the formation of the drug policy forum of massachusetts which was formed really around 2002 uh, kind of legally um with as a c3 c4 but um it had a couple of um let me i have some notes here that so it, it got complicated when i tried to figure out the order in which all these things happen um, the first of all, the Drug Policy Forum of Massachusetts was something that was formed um, specifically to work on legislation, to um, to really focus on legislative campaigns. And by the end of the 1990s, I think with MassCan, even though we were doing lots of legislative things as as MassCan, lots of um, you know, we got those two bills through and uh, many things. The rally had become um, really big. And, um, you know, both in numbers of people who came and, and bands and speakers, and it was like a, a big event for a very small organization to put together. And so, you know this well, because you were running the whole thing. Um, and so uh, I think it kind of sapped the time and energy and made it hard to focus on legislative campaigns would be one thing. And then I think the other thing was people felt like the Freedom Rally wasn't something that was going to convince legislators that they should hop on board with legislation. It was like the wrong image, um, which I think is true. I think the Freedom Rally served many other purposes and uh, and still does. Well, it wasn't the legislature that uh, pulled us out of prohibition. Right, exactly. Yeah. But 2020 hindsight, um, we, um, we worked the legislature for many years. That's a longer story. But, um, but in any case, there were like people who wanted, um, and, and also there were people who wanted to work on more a broader drug war picture, I think, because as we as we went through um, the 1990s, which I maybe want to go back to some of the organizations that formed like DRC Net, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, Forfeiture. There were all the treatment people. There were so many other uh, things um, ha happening. So I think people wanted this bigger umbrella of, um, of drug issues to deal, to deal with. So actually, <clears throat> there were two years um, before the Drug Policy Forum of Massachusetts started. In the year 2000, John Holmes coined yet another uh, uh, MCRML, the Massachusetts All right. Coalition for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Oh, yes. And, um, and Krimla. Right. Krimla, but with an M in front of it or something like that. It's hard to keep track of them all. But um, uh, for that whole, like in 2000, that's when we did um, <coughs> the first public policy questions. And um, so it was not only Krimla that, that did them, but MassCan, you know, did their own. You know, we there were always many people working um, on, um, I mean, I think that's one of the beauties of, you know, 
there's some ways in which it, um, you could say things were dysfunctional, but anybody who was dysfunctional was off busy working, um, <laughs> you know, their own public policy question or, um, but in any case, in 2001, there was this um, CRIMLAR, M-C-R-M-L, which, um, which worked for two years. Um, and the first round was the public policy questions in the year 2000. And we did Senator Shannon's district, which was a Senate district. Um, and I think that's the one that uh, CRIMLA did. And we did that specifically because Shannon had been opposed to um, medical marijuana, I think, in the 90s. And he was, um, his district was Somerville, Medford, whatever, and he was an ex-cop. And so, again, we were trying to turn legislators to our, you know, to our issue. And he ultimately became the lead sponsor on, um, on our decrim bill that we filed. Um, we being crime law, mass can, you know, we, we filed a decrim bill in 2001 or 2002 and Shannon was the lead sponsor. So um, this precursor to drug policy forum did Shannon's district. I think John Leonard did a one down on the Cape for medical Shirley Gomes and then maybe mass can and Steve did two more. So, um, and then uh, another thing that Kremlin did was um, John, I think John Holmes and uh, probably um, Dick Evans wrote the bill, but John Holmes and Scott Mortimer went in and filed uh, decrim and medical marijuana bills at the state house and then did a lot of work like got, they had really good lead sponsors like Shannon and um, I forget who the person was from Brookline that I think did the uh, medical. Uh, Byron Rushing might have been in there. Uh, I'll remember. Scott had gotten a, a rep from Brookline to be the lead on medical. Anyway, I think people, um, John and Scott, uh, and this isn't John Leonard. I don't remember what role he had, but John Holmes and Scott lined up, you know, 15 sponsors and um, handled, um, I'm trying to think, I think a lot of ACLU people were involved and, um, and so they just worked on filing serious bills and trying to get them to move along. So that really went on from 2000 to like around 2002. And then um, the Drug Policy Forum, it, so there was, I think there was like a big meeting in the winter for people who were interested in forming this bigger, you know, drug policy. I remember going, you know, because there were Western Mass people too, there were, you know, 30 or 40 people in a room talk, trying to talk about what this would be and what it would do and stuff. And um, and then the uh, Marijuana Policy Project uh, announced that it was, um, it had a grants program that they would give like a $50,000 grant for the kind of mostly marijuana work, of course, that would be done. So um, Scott wrote these grant proposals, which is something he's really talented at doing. And we got a $50,000 grant and, uh, and we, we got another one, I think, the following year. Mike Cutler raised some money from a uh, contact that he knew, ultimately the Drug Policy Alliance. So over the next couple of years, we had funding, for better or for worse. Sometimes money is good and sometimes it's not, but we, we did some really good um, projects. Um, and so, but by the time the Drug Policy Forum was formed, the group of interested people had dwindled down to like, there was Scott Mortimer, I don't even know if John Holmes was part of it, Michael Cutler, me, uh, John Leonard was not part of things then, Rob Stewart. Um, so there were really, Aaron Wilson from uh, UMass yeah. Amherst. So there were really about five of us and 
Aaron got a lawyer to, to write up all the 501c3, c4, all the documentation. Scott did the grant proposals. So then we had money. Were the uh, grants for anything in specific or, or I mean, was, was there a specific project in mind that the grants were designed for? Uh, my, I didn't look up the grant proposals. I suspect it was like we were basically saying we would work on decrim and medical and we would uh, do a lot of kind of coalition building. Um, we would file legislation. We, you know, we would do all this work towards getting um, medical and decrim uh, moving forward in the state. And so- um, The money was to pay for uh, paper and ink and I mean, we were gonna be hiring anyone or I mean- was Yeah, we did. Um, have an office or? So we had, um, uh, we did have an office um, and, um, let me see. Uh, so I think, so we had an office up um, actually very close to the state house, um, right on Tremont Street. And um, we didn't hire anybody r right at the beginning. We kind of gathered this money and held on to it. Um, we filed um, three pieces of legislation. We filed a diversion to treatment bill. Um, and so uh, diversion to treatment rather than prison. And I think um, Mike Cutler and Rob Stewart worked on, they were the people who were behind that. We filed um, two marijuana bills, the uh, decrim and medical. Um, Aaron also had assembled this an amazing kind of board of advisors um, for our organization. Then we ran um, public policy questions in 2002, and that was the year there were really a lot in this. There were like 39 public policy questions in in the state. So, Drug Policy Forum ran some, Mass Can ran some. Like they were, uh, it was really. Uh, just a really huge amount of public policy questions. And I think actually, maybe that's when we did the ones in Boston. I think so. Because you, I think you gathered some, some gathering all over in, like, yep. in a really difficult, like Roxbury or something like that. There were some areas where we heard gunfire in the background. Right. I wasn't there. I think I was at a supermarket in South Boston, but anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, there were, um, and, and, and uh, also you got attitudes from people sometimes in the deep inner city, uh, a, a white person going there to, you know, peddle marijuana reform wasn't necessarily something that people reacted to kindly. I mean, we had, of course, a lot of supporters, but we had some people who were very offended. Right. Um, we, uh, want to get a few things in here. Um, I think S Scott, uh, this is all, we did hire two executive directors, but we use some of our money. Like we hired Jeffrey Myron to do a fiscal study of decrim and he was in the economics department at BU. So we use some of our money there. Um, we did, um, and I, I might be off on my timeline here. I know that we hired um, this ju former judge, I think uh, Jim Dolan to go and Scott and Jim Dolan went into the legislature and um, Jim Dolan made presentations like 25 presentations to legislators. Um, that was another project that was done. Um, and then, um, we kind of had this, I think we had like about $100,000 sitting around at that point. And, and, and so we, we did hire um, a full-time executive director, a young woman who had been working at the ACLU in Connecticut, Fatima Gunja, and uh, she stayed six months. Um, 
uh, and I don't, she wasn't as non, she was an out of state person. So she wasn't very knowledgeable about kind of in state, the way things worked. Um, and, um, and then, so the following year, so I think that was it in 2003, we also had Jeff Myron do that report. And then in 2004, uh, uh, just so everybody knows, Jeff Myron went on to do many, many studies of cannabis law, moderation, and things like that, right. including now studies of places that have already legalized cannabis to see what happened economically as a result. Yeah. And uh, Normal went on to hire Jeff for a whole bunch of stuff, too. So this yeah. may have been just the beginning of what became a very fruitful relationship. Right. Yeah. And I think he's also the chairman of uh, the Department of e Economics at Harvard. Uh-huh. And he's, he's a libertarian. He's the dean of the School of Economics. Uh, he's a libertarian also, right? I believe so. I remember hearing him speak one time, and he persuaded me of many things with his economic arguments that were, like, astounding. But I don't remember examples, but it was like, just change the way you think about something. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then we had an opportunity each time we hired somebody we did, and it was mostly Scott and Rob Stewart did like really intense job searches. We would list the job and, um, and then interview, you know, 10 or 15 people do first, second cuts through people and then make an offer to somebody. So after Fatima left, uh, we, um, we heard that Whitney Taylor was, uh, available to be considered. And she was somebody who really had at least, you know, 10 years already with, I think, the Drug Policy Foundation, the Drug Policy Alliance, she may be MPP. She was like, she really knew marijuana policy and drug policy um, and had done this kind of work for a long time. So um, we hired her. And um, and then along with Whitney, we hired uh, a lobbyist, Marianne Walsh, to do some uh, work and um, on our decrim and medical bills. And um, by, you know, a year and a half later, two years later, we, MPP canceled its grants program. I think DPA, the same thing. So we've kind of blown through all our money and um, Whitney left and we, carried on with Mary Ann Walsh for um, uh, another year, I think till the end of the year. I see. But Whitney didn't go very far. Right, she went right across town to the ACLU, where she <laughs> ran the, um, didn't she run the decrim and um, medical campaigns? She did indeed, and uh, those were of course successful. Yeah. Uh, but she had two different employers uh, of course, Marijuana Policy Project ran Decrim, uh, and then Medical was run by Peter Lewis. Uh -huh. and, uh, I don't think he actually had an organization other than what he just developed himself. Right. Um, but we were there too. <laughs> yeah. uh, and just so everybody knows, uh, Whitney uh, was brought to Massachusetts by Maddie and, and her groups here. Um, uh, but she's been very successful. Um, uh, and now she is a, uh, 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 a director at the ACLU of Massachusetts. Huh. So, uh, and also Whitney is of course a sailing gal. Oh. <laughs> uh, so she, she and you have that in common as well. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, so as I recall, uh, there was an unsuccessful ballot initiative uh, about the transfer of forfeiture proceedings. Um, can you tell us about what that effort was? And um, I know about it, but that was not the Drug Policy Forum of Massachusetts. Okay. And I just know that they were gonna fund treatment with forfeiture money and I think Mike Cutler worked on that, maybe Dick Evans. And I know the Criminal Justice Policy Coalition, which kind of surprised me. It's like a little organization. Um, Eric Sterling. No. Oh, you know what? Maybe I'm confusing. Maybe it was Eric Sterling. 
Well, yes, you're right. Um, I thought it was like a little local Boston organization, but um, I don't really know. I was an outsider on that. It wasn't the drug policy forum and, right. and it failed, you know, it, it was polling fabulously and then it failed miserably, maybe because the district attorneys didn't like it and it was complicated. Right. Well, of course, the district attorneys would not like it. Uh, basically, um, I always thought of the police getting forfeiture money, kind of like uh, the guards standing around Jesus's cross during the crucifixion, um, gambling over the Jesus's clothes. <clears throat> um, uh, and taking his clothes and getting money for them. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's kind of like the state allowing police to do that. Uh, of course, the police can't spend that money on uh, themselves, not officially anyway, but they can uh, spend the money for something that's wrapped in police business. So for instance, if police business happens to require that you spend a week in Hawaii, <laughs> Uh, so be it. Yeah. Unfortunate, but it, it has to be done. Uh, so anyway, that's forfeiture. That's unfortunately still around. Right. Um, so uh, w w w I guess the upshot of this is I did have a question and I haven't actually asked it. Were you surprised that the activist you hired, uh, Whitney, became such a key person? Um. Well, with 2020 hindsight, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, I, I suspect Whitney 2020. was- 2020, hey, what do you know, right. it fits. Right, <laughs> right. Um, I think Whitney was ready to move on to issues bigger than um, the kind of marijuana activism. Um, some of the organizations had kind of gone out of like lost their funding. She was ready to move on to bigger things. And um, so I do think the drug policy forum was a stepping stone to that, you know, that she might have seen that the ACLU, uh, you know, was the kind of organization she might want to work with. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, did I know that at the time or no? No, no. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, I wanted to ask you also about Bay State repeal and about the new marijuana law that we have here in Massachusetts, because I'd be very interested in your perspective. Um, you know, I was involved with Bay State repeal. It was a, a version of legalization that was written by Steve Epstein. And of course, uh, Dick Evans wrote a version of legalization as well. Um, unfortunately, that one uh, we pressed in the legislature to no avail. Um, but uh, we did try to get the signatures to get Bay State repeal on the ballot. Uh, what do you think? Uh, if Bay State repeal had passed in Massachusetts, do you think that the, legis the legislature would have rewritten the bill the way that they did the um, regulate like alcohol? Well, let me just make sure I understand. So the Bay State repeal was to regulate marijuana more like um, food or an herb kind of thing? Like yeah, it left the regulation um, uh, to the departments that would normally handle these kinds of markets anyway. Right. So for instance, the regulation of it as a crop would be handled by the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. Right. Uh, the taxation of marijuana would be handled by the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Right. Uh, and there would be no creation of this new Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, the level of regulation, I have a feeling, uh, would have been much, much, much less. Right. But none of that would have mattered. And that's really the point of my question. Do you think the legislature would ever have allowed either one of these two versions to become law? Um, this isn't a big area of my expertise, but uh, from what I know of the Massachusetts legislature 
I mean, the fact that they immediately tampered with the law that uh, the voters had passed, immediately, you know, uh, delayed the implementation, added taxes, created the commission, you know, made it, you know, this mega business or whatever. Um, I, I just would think they would tamper with anything. And, you know, that 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 version would have been to, uh, I don't know, people, even the regulate like alcohol, well, people can relate to that because it's another intoxicant or something, but to regulate as food or, I, I have no idea what they would have done with that. So I'm not very good at speculating, but I'm sure they would be regulating or re rewrite. Well, yeah, uh, of course, um, you know, regulate like alcohol was, was, was the other campaign's idea of how to sell the idea. Um, uh, and that's a whole different take. Uh, what we end up with, of course, is not really regulation, anything like alcohol. Uh, in my estimation, what we end up with is regulation like enriched plutonium. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's the plutonium model of marijuana regulation where, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, licensing becomes very, very difficult. Regulations become, become chapters, uh, hundreds of pages long. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, the, the market becomes basically bottled up. Uh, and delivered to people who have legal and technical resources, the very, very wealthy. That's what we've seen time after time. Right. Uh, well, Maddie, it's been great talking to you. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the, the long history of cannabis reform in Massachusetts? Uh, we, were, we were ultimately to some degree successful, I hope. Right. Yes. I mean, I, I guess I just... Um, I, I just want to say, you know, I've been less active in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years than I, than I was um, in the first 20 or whatever. And so I just want to send out my thanks to the people who've continued to be incredibly active, um, which is you and many, many newcomers to the scene. And um, I just think uh, it was the most ex exciting political uh time of my life or one of the most exciting times of my life to be involved in a fight that was just like we were all passionate about and we had a lot of fun and did a lot of hard work and it was just like the most amazing political strategizing and I one thing I say to people is it took us almost 30 years but we basically our mission was to change um change the um uh, feelings of the voters. I mean, we, we, uh, it took 30 years to change the way people perceive, perceived marijuana. And that's what made us succeed through ballot questions and through an initiative, ballot initiative. Right on. All right, Maddie, thank you very, very much. All and, right. uh, and, uh, to all you viewers, uh, again, please visit MassCan at www.masscann.org and join us. You can be like Maddie. You can have a lot of fun and a lot of great experience. <laughs> Your whole summer gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can really dedicate yourself. Yeah, right. Oh boy, can you? Okay. Thank you, Maddie. Thank, thank you, you everybody. All right. Goodbye. Bye.